During the Sega Saturn's lifetime, the Japanese market saw hundreds of exclusive software releases that no other region ever received. Fighting games, shoot 'em ups, platformers, RPGs, you name it, and the Japanese Saturn had representation. Since the platform performed so poorly in other regions of the world, we rarely saw similar exclusive software anywhere else. That doesn't mean there wasn't any at all. And in this episode, we will be looking at the 15 games that were only released in North America for the Saturn. No Japanese version, no European version, just North America. I hope you guys enjoy North American Sega Saturn exclusives. While the Saturn had a depressing lack of NFL games in its life, there was no such shortage of professional baseball games. In May of 1997, Acclaim published the Iguana-developed All-Star Baseball 97 featuring Frank Thomas. This was sort of a sequel to Frank Thomas' Big Hurt Baseball, which was also done by Acclaim. Average is a good description of this one. Graphics, presentation, sound, gameplay, it's all sort of a middling experience that doesn't do anything terrible, but also doesn't stick out as anything particularly impressive. It has many of the genre staples you expect like season, playoff, and home run derby modes. Due to its later release, it's rare, and goes for much higher than you'd expect, prices that it most certainly doesn't justify in its quality. On one. Grounded to second. He's out at first. Also in May of 97, Acclaim published the former 3DO exclusive Battle Sport on the Saturn. This is a vehicle based sports game where you pilot an armor clad hovercraft that is outfitted with weapons and do battle in closed arenas. Inside this arena is a goal and a ball, and you need to pick up that ball and shoot it into the goal similar to a soccer game. The weapon play comes into the mix as a deterrent. You can destroy your foe temporarily or cause them to fumble the ball, giving you a chance to score. The gameplay is really floaty but easy to come to terms with, and while it isn't particularly exciting, it's fun enough for a little while. The visuals are extremely simple and suffer some pretty terrible clipping issues but it does at least run smoothly. It was also released in small numbers and sells for an absolute fortune on eBay. There was supposed to be a Japanese version released later that year, but its official release was canceled. The few copies of it that do exist in Japan sell extremely high as well. In October of 1996, Konami released its take on 3D Baseball with Bottom of the Ninth. I was really mixed on this one as well. I wasn't a fan of the split-screen presentation for the pitching and view of the bases, but did appreciate the fully 3D engine. It also has the Players Association license, but lacks the official teams, making for a peculiar mix of realism and fantasy. It has a season and general manager mode that does offer quite a bit of gameplay for those wanting some real depth to their baseball. That gameplay is also easy to pick up and have fun with. Definitely not the best baseball game on the Saturn, but it isn't worthless either. Now the pitch. A hard shot to short. Out! Out. The side is retired. After three innings, one, zero. In February of 1996, Acclaim was looking to capitalize on the immense popularity of the NBA Jam franchise, so they got developer Iguana to create a college version of it called College Slam. And that is exactly what this is, NBA Jam with college teams. There's a bunch of them too, so you are likely to find one you know and love. The gameplay has all the highs of the NBA Jam franchise as well, with its two-on-two -two hoops, 
crazy dunks, and great four-player action thanks to the six-player adapter support. But with all that said, you really need to ask yourself, what the hell is the point here? It doesn't use real players, so it's effectively an NBA Jam without the NBA license and the superstars. With NBA Jam Tournament Edition also on the system, that makes this the lesser of the two choices by a mile. March of 1996 was the day Sega bestowed the awful Congo the Movie on its fans. Developed by Jumpin' Jack Software, the team that also shat on us with the not-quite-as-awful Gen War, you roam around huge environments that all look the same and fight enemies that come out of nowhere, with weapons that offer about as much excitement as a swift kick in the ball sack. I mean, just take a moment and soak in the hideous attempt at game development. This is what Sega of America invested in for the Saturn. Instead of evolving its great Genesis franchises into the world of 3D polygons, this is what they sat around a conference table and agreed the Saturn needed. I know some of you like this game, but I am definitely not in that group. There is a reason this trash wasn't released in Japan or Europe. Simply put, not even publishers like Acclaim would touch this heap of steaming dog shit. The biggest surprise on this list has to be Contra Legacy of War. Released in May of 1997 by Konami, this was developed by Appaloosa Interactive, the company behind the quite decent Three Dirty Dwarves. Contra had a great and storied history at this point. After multiple NES games and the awesome Super Nintendo and Genesis efforts, this game surely was going to be nothing short of amazing, right? Well no, not really. There are two ways of looking at this game. The first, you take it on its own merits. It's a 3D top-down run-and-gun with a great deal of challenge. It has a number of power-ups to change up the gameplay, and the boss battles are pretty spectacular. The second way of looking at this is that it's just not a great Contra experience. The overhead view is so limited, and there are times where you will eat cheap hits by stuff just off the screen you couldn't see. The graphics are drab and consist of little more than green and brown textures, and jumping around in this viewpoint just feels wrong. One cool thing about it is, is that it does have an actual 3D mode, and shipped with the old school red and blue 3D glasses. The two player co-op helps a bit, but the starting over from the beginning of the stage after a death quickly zaps the fun factor from this. Not completely awful, but certainly well below the standard set by Contra 3 and Contra Hardcore. You would have thought that the reception of full motion video on systems like the Sega CD would have been enough to convince game developer Digital Pictures that their money was better spent elsewhere. But that didn't stop them from releasing a port of Corpse Killer for the Saturn in late 1995. You get dropped on an island infested with zombies and play along to video snippets about a madman's attempt to dominate the world. You shoot hordes of the undead in side-scrolling sequences that have been upgraded from the Sega CD version, though the light gun support of that earlier version is missing here. The most interesting thing about this release are the actors involved. You see familiar faces like Jean-Paul Jean-Paul from Seinfeld, and even Mr. Vargas, the crazy biology teacher from Fast Times at Ridgemont High, which just happens to have the sexiest woman from my youth, Phoebe Cates, in it. Outside of that, Corpse Killer Graveyard Edition is a pure cash grab that offers little over the other versions of the game. On the plus side, if you enjoyed those, you should find the modest improvements here enjoyable. Got it. You okay? He's okay, woman. I got the tour plan for antidote. Bullets too. Good <laughs> Can't afford to lose your roster, man. Okay, man, you call it. 
Around the same time as Corpse Killer, Digital Pictures also released Double Switch, starring the late Corey Haim. This is essentially Night Trap 2.0, set in a hotel where you must monitor rooms and conversations and trap the bad guys. I'm not a fan of these types of games as you know, and while Night Trap had an interesting story of vampires and young girls, this lacks any similar appeal. It looks better than the Sega CD release if you appreciated that version. You let those suckers get to the power box, and now we're all cut off. In May of 1997, Virgin Interactive published Grand Slam, yet another baseball game for the Saturn. In an effort to be wildly different, this one really takes its batting and pitching systems to the next level. Instead of the simple timing-based swing mechanics of most games, this one actually requires you to be accurate in the area of the actual pitch location. This really makes hitting the ball more of a challenge. When pitching, the usual front view has been traded for behind the pitcher view, and you now have a meter for both power and accuracy. Again, this makes the simple mechanics of most games far more difficult, and getting a strike over the plate in the beginning can actually be tough. These new gameplay challenges will either be celebrated by those looking for something different, or quickly dismissed by those that enjoyed the more casual play of other games. Grand Slam also isn't a terrible looking game, but it lacks the detail of more realistic presentations. It looks more like a minor league game than an MLB contest. It also lacks real teams, though it does have the licensed players. Lewis, it took some extra BP today, so look out. Foul ball! No one reached. In July of 1997, LucasArts gave us one of the Saturn's most unique 2D games, Herc's Adventures. It's an overhead action adventure that has Hercules and his pals trying to save the world from the dastardly Hades, who has kidnapped the goddess of spring and thus thrusting the world into a period of decay. Choose one of three warriors, each with their own strengths, and fight across a huge map that has tons of different areas and enemies to contend with. The excellent story and animation are the highlights here, and really set it apart from similar games of the previous generation. You'll find yourself having to get familiar with where you can go and what you can do in this game world, which can be frustrating at first, but you'll come around quickly and start bashing zombies, giants, and mutated boars before you know it. You collect additional weapons and items as you explore, and of course sometimes need to deal with keys and locked doors to progress the story. It's rooted heavily in Greek mythology, and has a world rich in humor, personality, and has some excellent voice acting. It's kinda like Diablo and Zombies Ate My Neighbors had a child, and that's not a bad thing at all. It's a casualty of the Bernie Stoller debacle, with Virgin Games canceling the European release after it was made clear that the Saturn was not Sega's future. Midway Games made sure you had access to a few Golden Age arcade classics on the Saturn with Midway Presents Arcade's Greatest Hits. Released in December of 1996 and developed by Digital Eclipse, you get Defender, Defender 2, Joust, Robotron 2084, Sinistar, and Bubbles. The majority of you likely know these games well, and the emulation quality here is just okay. With much more accurate and free ways to play these titles nowadays, compilations like this have little to offer other than their collectability as a physical release. This is not to be confused with the similar named Midway Presents Arcade Greatest Hits, the Atari Collection, which actually received a European release. Oh man, here we are back again with this train wreck. November 1996, Sega gives the gaming world NFL 97. 
It's a follow-up to the excellent Joe Montana and primetime NFL games for the Sega Genesis, though it lacks every single thing that made those games great. You get piss-poor visuals, atrocious gameplay, and point-blank one of the worst games available for the Saturn platform. It was an embarrassment to the Sega Sports brand, and a slap to the face of everyone who paid full price for it. The painfully slow gameplay feels nothing like the better games in the genre, and as you can see, the visuals leave much to be desired. NFL football is mostly a North American sport, so it's no surprise it was only released there, but that only spared the rest of the world from the pain and suffering of having to play it. Digital Pictures wasn't done with full motion video games on the Saturn, also releasing Quarterback Attack in November of 1995. Despite my general disdain for full motion video efforts, I actually found this one to be more enjoyable than most. Perhaps it's my love for the sport of American football speaking, but I was able to pick up the gameplay here quickly and found quite a bit of fun in its strategies. You are the rookie quarterback that must guide your team to as many victories as possible. The gameplay is entirely pre-recorded video from your vantage point. Choose a play and the video will play out one of many possibilities. The gameplay is shockingly deep for this type of game. You have control over which receiver you pass to on the fly and have the ability to scramble if the need calls for it. The only thing that sucks is, is that the flow of the game is nothing like a real game of football. Often the opposing team gets a kickoff only to punt the very next play, all in order to give you the control back. You also have no control over the defense, and the CPU can and will score on you out of the blue. Don't get me wrong, in no way is this a replacement for a good game of NFL football, but for a full motion video game, I found it far more playable than the other games on this list. Scud, the Disposable Assassin, is an early 1997 run-and-gun published by Segasoft. It follows the exploits of a robot assassin that decides he wants to live instead of self-destructing after his mission is complete. It's based on the comic of the same name and incorporates multiple gameplay perspectives, including side-scrolling and first-person shooting stages. It can be played with both a controller and the stunner light gun, and has two-player co-op. Scud here is such a valiant effort at being different from the 16-bit games it draws much of its inspiration from. The problem is, is that it's just so incredibly repetitive, both in gameplay and visuals. Stages are too long and you are often fighting hordes of the same enemies far too often. The gunplay does have its appeal, but this one could have really benefited from a bit more variety across the board. The pre-rendered visuals look okay most of the time, though everything starts running together after a while. I do recommend you try it, however. Many of you will bore quickly with it, but if you have two stunners handy, you may find this worth a playthrough. In November of 1997, Ask Games released Ten Pin Alley for the Saturn. This rather ugly game of bowling fully supported the six-player adapter, making it a really appealing party game. I won't BS you here, however. I could not play this game worth a damn. Not back then and not now. I just do not fully understand the meter in this game. I can try and repeat what I did to get a strike, only to get something wildly different. Watching my daughter try it was hilarious, as she grew frustrated quickly and didn't want to play it anymore. I have seen some people play it extremely well, so I know it's possible. The visuals are particularly ugly here, and there are only a handful of lanes to play on. Still, the Saturn isn't brimming with tons of bowling options, so if you are into the sport, you're gonna have to make do with this one.
As with my PAL exclusives episode, you come away from these games with the distinct impression that you didn't miss very much if you didn't play them. None of the baseball games here were anywhere near as good as Sega's World Series baseball games, pretty much leaving just Herc's adventures as the lone must play. The real shocker is, is that three of these games were from Sega themselves, and only saw release in North America. There was a time when Sega games were so good that third parties made sure they were released in other territories when Sega didn't do it themselves. Not so much with these here. I imagine this was a recurring theme with many companies during the Saturn's life. The conclusion being it just wasn't worth the financial risk to localize its games for other regions. It's why so many games stayed exclusive to Japan, and why so few exclusives were created in other regions. It was the challenge of being a Sega Saturn owner. If you wanted the best, you often had to go looking for them. I'm SegaLordX, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.